Welcome to the Commercial Real Estate Podcast powered by First National. I am Adam Powadic sitting here with Aaron Cameron at day two of the Toronto Real Estate Forum. This is part of our speaker video series and I want to thank our sponsors Dow Vukovic, ML Emporio Properties and Turner and Townsend. Uh, we have a returning guest, Sherry Larjani. We just, we just verified. She came mm-hmm. on about a year and a half ago. Uh, which in the current climate is long enough for a lot of things to change. I mean, these are, uh, if nothing else, rapid times. Um, she is president of Spotlight Development. Did I say that? Yes. Okay. Uh, editor, please delete my s- repetition of the title. No, you didn't say it the first time. You didn't. Oh. Okay. Okay. Editor, please leave in my first time <laughs> saying the same. The <laughs> this is the eighth title. one we've done. We're a little bit yeah. tired, yeah. clearly. Yeah. I can see yeah. that. Um, Sherry, welcome back to the podcast. Thanks for having me again. So last time Sherry came on, and we will put the the show link in the uh, show notes if anybody wants to go back and listen to it. Uh, it's a pretty interesting origin story for how Sherry got into real estate. Thanks to her father-in-law. That's all I remember. <laughs> yeah, right. yeah. Shout no out. No thanks to my yeah. father-in-law, yes. And I think a pink hard hat was uh, <laughs> something else I remember. <laughs> well, good yeah. memory, and kicking guys. ass, too. There's a lot of ass kicking on that, memory, on that podcast. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so we are, we're going to revisit affordability. I mean, it's not like that problem was solved in the last uh, 18 months. It's uh, just if, gotten worse, if anything. Yes, <laughs> yeah, there's, there's data to support, uh, support that theory. Uh, but just for anybody who's not going to listen to the whole episode, maybe just you can do the, you know, the abridged version of kind of who you are and, and uh, what Spotlight does just to set the stage. And then we'll jump into uh, finally solving the affordability crisis right here on the podcast we're doing today. It today. Okay, uh, good. Can't wait for that. Um, so yes, as you said, I'm, I'm the president of Spotlight Development. It's a development um, firm in, in Toronto, which primarily does um, work in the GTA. And we, I started doing for-profit only. So we, st- you know, we started the company with doing for-profit projects and you know, growing it from a small little subdivision to um, you know, condo projects and currently a 60-story at a corner of Queen and Church in partnership with Santa Court, which is you know, the tallest uh, of the projects that we have on the go. But um, in the last uh, three years, what we have done, three and a half years to be exact, we've, what we've done is we've started um, figuring out uh, or looking at how we can figure out the solution to the affordable housing crisis. And um, the solution for us was to do it at scale. And the only way we could have tackled it, in our opinion, is not to celebrate 30, 20, 30, 50 units here and there. It is actually go for scale and also bring speed. So with those two combinations in mind, you can actually tackle the affordable housing crisis. So we're done. Solved it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but that's the idea. And that's the, that's the mission and the goal that we have on the non-for-profit arm of our, our company. And we created partnerships um, so that we can establish a model where um, it can um, ex- sort of grow and, and also where we don't need to um, sort of get ourselves familiar with everything that we don't know so that we can ta- sort of tap into the expertise of the people around the table that already have it and then work with it and, and you know, hopefully do it faster. Let's start, uh, yeah, let's start with um, sort of macro perspective and kind of work in. So... How many projects, how many units, what's, what's going on right now in, in, in your world? So I'm going to say about 10,000 units on the go for the affordable housing component of our, of our company. Um, the for-profit, I honestly don't have the exact numbers in mind right now, but uh, for the non-for-profit, which is the biggest focus of our company right now, um, is about 10,000 units. And they, they, they are in different locations. You know, we didn't stick to Toronto only. And I think the reason we did that um, was obviously because we were able to find land in other places that were better priced, I don't want to say cheaper, but better priced and worked better with it, with the performance that we were putting together, but also because we wanted to work with different municipalities so that we are um, at least giving ourselves, um, you know, some opportunities to explore other municipalities and see how th- they will do things differently, right? And I think we've proven that municipalities matter. And, you know, projects uh, do go ahead when you have uh, good municipalities behind you and working with you. So... And where are, what stage are you at with those 10,000? So we, in Q3 of next year, we are starting construction on our 2 million square feet in Kitchener-Waterloo. We're starting with, with the first two towers, um, which is about a million square feet um, in Kitchener. Um, and then um, I know when I was here last, I talked to you guys about our Lawrence and Black Creek project. Very excited, 2,400 units in the heart of Toronto, uh, bringing all the services. Um, I'm still exactly where I was 
a year and a half ago, two years ago, when it, I sat here. had a here. lot of moving parts, if I remember yeah. correctly. Yeah. We are still exactly where we were. And I think I'm either the luckiest or the unluckiest person in the world because I don't think anyone can come and say, during the time I was working on this project, I had a mayor change on me, a minister of housing federal, a minister of housing provincial changed on me. And I think because our project is government um, sort of dependent, it affected us. Like many people can say, oh, well, okay, well, it doesn't matter who comes into power. But for us, it mattered because they were also helping us push the project through. And then we had all these delays. And, uh, n you know, not to say that the, it wasn't um, partly on the municipality, but it's just, you know, we're still there. But what happened since, since we went and we uh, purchased a property in Kitchener-Waterloo, and it's for 2 million square feet, as I mentioned, transit-oriented, uh, and we had amazing support from the municipality and the region of Waterloo, which was surprisingly interesting. And, you know, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm like, I want to go back and I want to do more in Kitchener-Waterloo, to be very honest with you. Same as Brampton. Like, we're working on a project in Brampton. Again, the mayor, the staff there are, you know, even though it's the beginning stages of it, they're, they're problem solving with us, which is interesting, you know, to see the mayor of, of Brampton being so eager to actually bring more housing. And to ask us what he can do is is phenomenal. Refreshing. It, it, completely refreshing. Although I can't, I can tell you that I got the same reception in Kitchener Waterloo as I got in Brampton, and I think we're now exploring some options in Zuberi as well. Again, the same sort of reception. So it's f brand new, but just. During this recent fall economic update, uh, the federal government announced sort of an incentive funding program for municipalities to deliver faster projects to, to change zoning. Has that got you excited or is that, do you think that will have a material impact? If I'm going to be honest and if I don't get myself in trouble as I usually do, none of these excite me. Because the fact that they announce it is one thing implementing it and actually making it available for people like us to use it is another story. So, you know, there are so many programs since that the last time we talked that just came into, um, you know, the, the part of the legislation or announcements and things like that. We haven't seen the effect of it yet. So, yes, I'm excited uh, to um, see them actually help us be able to The HST waiver on apartments? That definitely helped, but I tell you, the, the cost of constructions are still something that the only thing that that did is made it so much easier for us to accept that ex increase in the cost of construction and for us to say, <laughs> oh, okay, well, this is going to take some of that away, right? And this, I'm, I'm hearing that there's a forecast that the construction costs are supposed to go down. And it's very interesting that I haven't, I'm yet to see that to actually show up in our performance, right? So I think when that shows up, and the HSC and, and all the, you know, new sort of things that are coming, especially, you know, the, for, for building um, apartments, that, then I will celebrate them. Because at this point, they still, haven't, they still haven't penciled out the way we want them to pencil out, at least in our projects, especially in the affordable housing world. I'm not talking about the market rentals, because the market rental, the rents have gone up so in such a crazy fashion that you can't compare them to the affordable housing where you're stuck to certain numbers and certain rents that you can offer. So that's that's a difficulty we're having with the uh, with the rental units that we're doing in our in our uh, affordable housing projects. Define but affordable. Let's just yeah, go there that's first. That's a good question because there's 17 um, different my, versions. My uh, version of it or every different municipality's version of it. Yeah, just to start with yours yeah. and then maybe, uh, oh, maybe well, contradict. Exactly, the, uh, yeah. Well, I tell you, I think affordability now literally should be taken out of the conversation because it's not even a matter of affordability anymore. It's a matter of having housing available. So I think we should be looking at housing and not affordable housing. It's just a long, completely twisted wrong way of looking at it, especially because nobody actually has a definition for it. If I were to go by the book and say, oh, okay, uh, is it geared towards income? Income affordability, or is it 80% AMR affordability, or is it that I'm going to go 60% below AM, like AMR because it's indigenous housing? Like, what am I looking at? Which which one of it is th is it that I'm looking at? Am I doing ownership? If I'm doing ownership, which model am I doing? Whose model? Uh, you know, there's so many players in the affordable ownership world. Like, who am I following? And attainable housing, which is a new term that we used a lot and recently has um, we've been hearing from the government as well. What is the really attainable housing. The definitions that they're providing as a guideline for us to start talking about it 
are going to be impossible for us to deliver. You know, and it's um, it's 90% below the market. We're doing 90% below market, but believe me, even with 90% below market on ownership models, we still can't do it. It's still not affordable. So I think the definitions are, are they, they, they don't mean anything. I don't think anybody should pay attention to what the definition is. We should bring, we should, we should just bring in, every partner that does their own model based on what they think affordability is and you know like we are doing partner with them bring them into one project and call it an affordable housing project just because they're all coming in and bringing in their participants that are waiting on these long lists whether it's rental whether it's ownership whatever the case is whether it is supportive housing like what is the definition for affordable supportive housing how do you define that you know it's just so complicated and i think putting one um definition for affordable housing just messes everything up and i think that's not the way it should be done so for us we define affordable housing by providing tools for people to be able to get into the market whether it is rental or ownership and that's how we define it how's the um, not-for-profit structure work so we the not-for-profit as far as structure exactly what do you mean do you mean like how does it work within our entity or how does it work with so well let's start with your entity yeah, and, then, and then both all the way yeah. across yeah so the entity the non-for-profit arm of our company is run by members and board where they are partly from the industry um people that we know you know, can have an effect on, on the actual crisis of affordable housing and experts that we know in the industry, as well as uh, all of the non-for-profits that we partner with. So we ask for their participation into the non-for-profit that we have created. But what and how that non-for-profit actually manages to do the work that they do is in um, partnerships that are done in silos with every one of the non-for-profits separately based on their terms that works for them and based on the number of units they can deliver, based on the needs for every group. And those agreements are done with the non-for-profit and that's how we kind of structure it and make it work. What's the biggest barrier to delivering affordable by any definition product into the market? So, I, I, you know what, I get this question a lot, and my answer to you is it's not one thing that's the biggest barrier. But I can put five things together and tell you, if all of these are resolved, then we have a solution. I was speaking at, uh, and again, my, after, the event, uh, the, after I spoke, my, my, one of my staff was like, I was just hoping you wouldn't go further from that and like, get yourself in trouble. But I say get all three levels of government into a room, close the door on them until they figure out how to tackle this in alignment and then get them out because this is not going to get resolved without the municipality, the entitlement process, the fact that we have to wait for everything to happen, the fact that everybody's doing the blame game when there are things that new tools that are given to the non for profits such as Bill 23 where it says, hey, DC exemption, and you go to municipalities and the municipalities are like, um... How do you exactly want me to give this to you when I have to spend money on roads and infrastructure and this and that? You know, that's not been resolved. And then how do you go to CMAC and say, hey, I need funding for these projects when they say, yes, they have all of these new things that they bring to the conversation. But for my project, I got to go through five different programs through CMAC to be able to get funding for one project. Every single one of them takes nine months. Imagine doing five of them. You know, God help anyone who's looking at these papers paperwork so streamlining the process whether it is through the federal provincial or municipal government as well as for all of them to come up with a solution that this streamlining isn't happening only at the municipality but it's it goes further beyond that and it gets streamlined all the way through so that every one of them knows exactly what their responsibilities are and they can actually do something about it you know that's one of the biggest things that we're advocating for these days saying hey guys come together do something because otherwise everybody can come up with their own solution is it effective not not on its own it do needs other things do you find it's like herding cats yes well it's 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 a it's a crazy situation because you even heard mayor chow came up with this plan where she wanted to take on the role of the developer and actually build this but then she came out and she said I'm not going to be able to do this without funding from the provincial government and the federal government and the non-for-profit sector and the private sector. Okay, we're all speaking the same language. It's all about getting everyone together. So a municipality alone can't do it. A provincially, and uh, you know, 
provincial government cannot enforce everything and just make things happen. It has to all come together um, for for all of this to work. I mean, to your point, it's like herding cats. Once you get yes. all the cats in the barn, then they change, and then I'll uh, yeah. a new one. Yes, but let's wait for that to happen. And contradictory policies and uh, all of it just makes your head spin. Well, I love, you know, fe- the, we, we've got this new HST waiver, and other provinces are following. See, I think Vancouver and Ontario or BC and Ontario have followed, and then you know the the reigning um, the conservative leaders are saying we would we would scrap it immediately. It's like okay, yeah. awesome, thanks. Yeah. Looking forward to that, right? Exactly, so, yeah. exactly. Well, especially when development timelines are likely to span multiple governments. You know, it's you can't get in the ground fast enough. You can't build fast enough. You can't complete fast enough. You know what? It's interesting that you bring that up because um, I was debating with my one of my our consultants, who's you know who's a our planning consultant. And, you know, we were arguing over something that we wanted to do. And I was like, okay, well, you know what? They have 120 days to give us a response or they have to give us the money back. And he started laughing. I said, why are you laughing? He said, it's going to take you six months to go pre through pre-consultation to get your application in. So they really have nine months. So they actually now have found a way to delay and mm-hmm. not work with the structure and the, and the mandate that they've been given. That you have 90 days to respond to an application or you have to give the money back. Now, the process before your, admission, uh, your, uh, your application is accepted as complete is now six months. So y- y- it's the same wait time. Nothing really changes. Meanwhile, you're sitting on a uh, land loan at Prime Plus Two. Uh, you're sitting on a land loan that the Prime kept on going up and up and up. Look at it in the last year and a half. And, you know, I tell everyone, I said, we as developers are hurting from every side. Because it's not only that we can't figure out how to pay for the increasing cost of the land loans that we're sitting on but also we can't get the buyers to come and buy because everybody's now running away saying oh i'm going to wait till the market like sort of gets better or their interest rates drop so we're like literally somewhere in between getting sandwiched between two like really difficult uh, sort of groups which is you know the lenders on the the land side as well as the buyers on the other side or in the commercial lenders that uh, sorry the residential lenders that would give you know, lending to these people to come and buy our units. I guess she, I think it's just a really bad timing for our industry. So unless something really happens, um, forget about affordable housing. N- no, no housing, housing yeah. is going to happen. Yeah, five dollar per square foot of rents can barely you know make a feasible pro forma in the city of Toronto right now. Exactly. We've had two different economists here at the forum on both days. Both have said rates are going down by a couple hundred basis points in 2024. So there's a little bit of hope. There is hope, but, you know, we all have to sort of drag ourselves up until that time that we see that happening. I'm hearing that by the end of 2025, we're going to get to 3% and then maybe lower by the year after or many different variations of this. But we still have to carry all of these assets. You're hearing so many crazy things on the news these days about what's happening to developers projects that are stopping now. Imagine what's happening a year and a half from now when many more projects are coming to a time where they need to start selling them. And it's just going to be, there has to be some method of control that we put into these, the way we're doing it. And I think it's just going to, we're not thinking about it, but I think there's going to be, the demand will be there, but the supply will be so much that it will still create that sort of problem for all of us. Do you think, there's, do you think there's more... Um challenges to come i mean of course we've got van dyke that was out in the news yes. i mean the one which i think is a little bit different that that's been kind of you know unfortunately been kind of meandering towards a receivership for a while that's that's the mizrahi project up on at bloor and young Are there, is there more do you think to come just because of the fact that there's been such long runways to get shovels in the ground the, the buyers on the condo sides aren't there land prices are going up well but land, sorry, land loans or have prices have gone up, so there's a lot of carry costs. Yeah, I think there will be small things that you can hear about um, here and there, but I think all in all, uh, the development industry is going to keep itself survive and survive. Um, I think the people who are running most of these um, um, companies are. Th- th- many of them have gone through this once before, so it's sort of like they're always waiting for it and they're always keeping an eye out so that if something like this happened, how they're going to prevent it. Like there will be people like me who haven't gone through that as part of their business and this is the first time they're facing it. And yes, we will run into a trouble here and trouble there, but we will manage to pick ourselves back up and, and keep running with it if we are, you know, if we really mean to stay in this business. Um, so I think, um, you know, I don't like for that to be the way we look at the industry and the way that we see it moving forward. Um, I think um, uh, the development industry is pretty pretty strong, um, and I think they can 
pretty much hold them, hold themselves up until we get those. Uh, yeah, well, that's off. the hope. I mean, you, that, uh, unfortunately, the Van Dyke scenario. There, you know, really, there's been a couple more in the you know, out west. It's only a couple, but to your point, if if it continues, there's just that fewer developers, that much more. Yes. Because once it loans go into receivership or once files go into receivership, it's not a quick turnaround before yeah. someone steps in and continues to build. Those oh. units those units are off the market for a long period of time. Well, and it just scares away new capital from going into projects as well. If people are not currently invested, puts them on the wait-and-see mode for a little bit. I think they have been in that mode for a very long time already, which is one of the troubles, right? Like, you know, we are running into that as well. Like, we, have a, we are seeing a lot of um, lenders taking their time issuing papers and actually um, you know bringing funding into the projects which is delaying a lot of um, the financings that we are trying to do which ultimately gets us in a trouble here and there as I mentioned so it's not that it's not that it has not been happening and this is going to start to happen and people have been sort of saying we're pencils down we're pencils down we're pencils we've been hearing this for a pretty long time right uh, you know oh no we're pencils down um, so you know, I think people need to pick up those pencils and start looking and underwriting the deals and actually bringing money and capital into these projects because it doesn't matter, as I said, I, that was my pessimist side saying, hey, it's still going to be too many condos launching at the same time and too much too much happening. But at the same time, I know for a fact that there's going to be more people coming in. There's mm. going to be more need for housing. It just has to be structured properly so it doesn't become mayhem, right? So we do not want to have the industry going crazy again with, you know, and, and again, like... Um, uh, all the brokers I work with and all the agents forgive me for saying this but I think that was something that we brought on our on our industry ourselves you know when we do multiple offers in a fashion that we did it before it kind of created this illusion and that illusion of the market you know the price is going up and you got to get into the game and you got to buy this property it just created this um, problem in this bubble as everybody was calling it so I I say we got to we got to have uh, some systemic changes to the way we sell these units the way we um you know the cooling off period well that that we someone was yet. saying i can't remember if it was on air or not i have had so many conversations about real estate over the last couple of yeah. days but someone was saying that you know normal times you know whether that was you know in the 2000s or even after the financial crisis leading up to like 15 16 17 it took a year to sell a project that yes. was normal exactly. and then we kind of got spoiled where you'd do this launch at a golf course and you'd sell it on a weekend and that it almost like people thought to started to believe that that was how it was supposed to work and I think that was just a, yeah. a false, a false expectation. And and I don't know if you guys agree with me, but I think we have become um, an industry where not only our parties are extravagant, we our, our launches are now crazy. Like the way we launch projects right now is very different than we did four or five years ago, right? There's a lot of more um, blown whistle, as they say, or like there's a lot more to it uh, beyond just selling the units, right? Before, you know, you would hear someone offering like a car when you buy a unit. You were like, oh my God, what are they doing? But now it's like, it's just becoming more and more and again uh, thanks to our amazing teams on the marketing side figuring out how we should market these things but I still think that we need to we need to really get to the core of the problem sell proper housing sell it the proper way and not to create the bubble that's going to end up hurting all of us right who's 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 hurting the most yes developers are hurting but so is the real estate industry right they're not selling any units because nobody's buying the units because of all the things that you know not to blame them there's interest rates there's all of those things but the reason inflation went up i think can all like it's just like it's you all know, interconnected you it's all interconnected right and yes covid happened so it's <laughs> yeah the big disruptor all of us are not are you know we're all mindful of that obviously so you come back on the podcast 18 months forward it's been 18 months since we saw you last uh are we in a better or worse position in terms of trying to deliver affordability Ah, how am I going to answer that without getting myself? <laughs> <laughs> so um, I think we're in the worst place as far as not my projects, but as far as the overall look at how we're looking at housing. Um, you look at every city across Ontario and you can see more people on the street. What is that a confirmation of? A confirmation of the fact that we are lacking in housing and supports that they need in order for them to be able to do what they, you know, to, to survive, right? So I think um, the problem has gotten worse. Are we able to get our solutions sort of implemented? Yes, we're closer. 
in some municipalities and lagging in some other municipalities. So it's not a universal um, problem. Some municipalities are really actively pushing things through, care about bringing housing, and um, some municipalities haven't gotten there yet. And I don't think that's... Um, I don't think we can entirely blame them because many of the ones that I'm referring to might have had too many changes that might have stopped them from actually pushing the projects through the way they should have. And I think it, it will pick itself up. Um, and I think there's a greater focus on that. But I think the more we hear about it, the more people talk about it, um, the more the understanding it, it becomes you know something available to everyone to figure out how to do affordable housing like everybody's running away like all the developer partners of mine i tell them to do affordable housing They're like oh, okay okay well don't say that don't mention that in front of the counselor or we're gonna like we'll just pay you know it's just there's a stigma that we created ourselves about affordable housing when we say affordable housing people automatically start to think about shelters like we're not talking about shelters we're talking about you know people some of the people we're going to be housing in our projects are nurses teachers people that actually make good money they just can't afford to buy a house we are giving them housing you know the, so many of the new immigrants that come to canada educated new immigrants that come to canada like my mother-in-law is an amazing dermatologist she just never bothered to you know go through the system here and, and you know she keeps on going back home and working and coming back because she can right but there are a lot of people that are stuck here and they don't have that opportunity and they have to go through this crazy process to get accredited in canada to be able to work we have a lot of those people coming so why don't we put that energy towards teaching them new to new skills like you know we are focused on skilled trades you guys tell me if you we're not going to run into a problem with scarcity of labor in the next couple of years uh, you know I was and it's funny because there's there's pro, like there's different different ways of looking at it. I was uh, talking to someone and they were like I was saying oh my god the average age of a crane operator is 60 and they're like oh don't worry soon we're not even going to need crane operators because there's going to be someone sitting in their room with a with a computer and nobody needs to go all the way up there to operate a crane but up until we get there mm -hmm. you still need those crane operators and if they're all you know, average age is 60, then that means many of them are going to be out of the business. The same thing you're seeing, like uh, there, most of the immigrants that are coming to Canada are coming, and this is, this is something I heard from um, um, someone that was doing some research for us, and he was from, an in, uh, from, he was from India. So he was telling me, they're bringing 40% uh, uh, immigrants from India in Canada. And our culture doesn't like skilled trades. We don't think of it as you know, a proper um, job you know, accounting, nursing, um, doctors, and things like that are, you know, good opportunities that we'll look for. But that education has to come in. So there has to be some sort of a system that is put in place where you bring in skill trades, right? So a lot alignment between yeah, the, the skills 100%. that are coming in and what we need. Well, Michael, exactly. Michael Broccolini was in the podcast yesterday, and he mentioned that less than 2% of all the immigrants coming in would fall in the skills trades category. Yes, uh, and how many of them are we training here so that even when they get here and they don't have the skills, we can actually get them into the labor market? Mm -hmm. You can't. Yeah, it's not day one. They don't go no. from the airport to the job site. No, it's, they don't. Yeah, they could no, be sitting around don't. for years waiting. Exactly. You know how many yeah. work visas are being issued these days? What are they being issued on absolutely everything except the things that we need which are skilled trades to tackle the crisis of housing which is one of the biggest problems that we're having we can't say bring in doctors because we know it's going to take five years for them to actually become doctors in canada we can't say bring nurses because it's going to take another couple of years for them to actually be able to to work here but skilled trade can start working from day one and that's something that we're missing we need to bring them in we need to get them and even after we bring them in, one of the things we're doing in our projects, and we have um, signed agreements with a couple of the colleges in, in, in Ontario, is that we are we are focusing on, on providing about 10,000 square feet of, of educational facilities, so skill trades that we're we're, we're going to be because we are we are expecting an influx of um, new immigrants in our projects. We're saying, hey. Let's put the tools at their hands and say, guys, you can go here and become an electrician. It's not as difficult as you think. Or you can become a carpenter, a finished carpenter. Or you can be absolutely anything that we might need. So we'll educate you. This is our way of creating workforce housing. You live in this project. You learn from us. And then we'll put you back into our projects. So it's like... The best way to do it, right? So that's something that we are heavily invested in. But it should be done through 
the proper government channels because we are a very small entity trying to push this through. And if it's not done through the government where they see the need to bring in skilled trades, as you said, nobody's going to come off the plane and go and start working on a, on a, on a um, job site because they just can't. Unless they're forced to. And then if they are, then they'll be, you know, they don't have the skills. So they end up doing yeah, things that it's just, yeah. yeah. If somebody wants to reach out to get a hold of you regarding the nonprofit or initiatives, where do they reach you? Um, I'm always available through LinkedIn. Um, I think my phone number is probably on all of the business cards I've given out um, and my email address. And everybody in my office is um, absolutely interested to speak to anyone who's interested in working within the affordable housing world or to help us um, bring in more or partner with us, right, from the non-for-profit sector or from the private sector where they have funding and money. Uh, before we let you go, uh, we talked about it at length on the last episode, but for those that didn't hear it, maybe just talk quickly about the success of Rena. Oh, wow. You should see how it looks now. <laughs> Drive by and you'll see we're, on, you know, we're in the sixth floor and it's beautiful. And I think besides the fact of the, the, the project being a building that's being erected and built in, in, in Canada, I think the, what it did is it, it sort of, again, um, sh sh it is put the woman in the spotlight. Just explain what it is, suppose they don't know. So it's um, the first all-female development in Canada. So we started um, the project with me and Taya Cook. And what we did is we hired all the females in the industry that we knew of and we were working with already and some that we did not know. And we brought them all together and we are building a condo in uh, um, Etobicoke in, in Toronto. And um, it worked out beautifully. Um, uh, you know, against um, many of the negative comments and the positive comments that we got. But it also brought a, a, a lot of publicity to the project, which in some ways I always say is so unfortunate that just because the project is all female, it should get this much publicity. That kind of goes back to the core of the problem, that there is so much lack of female representations in our industry that this project got so much publicity. We don't mind it. We loved it. It was, mm -hmm. you know, great. Getting into New York Times, like I, seeing my own picture in New York Times, I, I, oh, come on, I never <laughs> thought about it. But, you know... Um, or Oprah magazine, although I was extremely pregnant and <laughs> not the best picture, but it's just the fact that it happened was amazing. But then, you know, if you get into New York Times, there is a reason, right? And you can see that it's um, it's something that's affecting a lot of women in this industry. And I think it needs to be addressed. And I can tell you, we haven't solved that problem either. That problem still exists and uh, it needs to be dealt with. And we need more female representations in this industry. Look at the forum here. And I keep on saying that to everyone. Look and at the room and the number of men that are standing around and the number of women that are you know representing different development companies in Canada within the room that we're sitting that we're sitting in here today so the, the only counterpoint I would make to that is uh, this tends to be more senior people if you walk around an office and look at the people under 30 is more balanced I'm not even um, gonna I'm not even we'll gonna come on over to our office no we'll, uh, but I'll tell you the floor. yes unfortunately there's yeah. a lot of support oh, like, oh there's a there's a million miles to go do well, I wouldn't say support staff yeah. they're just they're just younger generation making their way through the ranks like I think in, in 10 15 years from now I think that that, that proportion changes as when the, as they, when the company as starts paying yeah. from the yeah, as the as the older generation start to move well, start to retire of, but there's a lot of women in the senior roles that can be here that I know of and that can be put into um, the roles that they're not filling in now. So yes, I hear you. And this is a great news anyways, hearing that this is happening. But I still think that um, overall, we still need to work on that. So. Agreed. Oh, it's, it's, a, it's an ever, ever evolving, ever, ever. It's a, it's a, it needs constant attention. Let's put 100%. it that way. Yeah. So one one final question. It's just it's just a yes or a no. We are, we've gone way over time here, and I apologize for okay. keeping you here too long. <laughs> Don't worry. Uh, in twenty years, are we in a better place than where we are now? Yes or no? Only with interventions. Yes. Okay. Without it, no. Okay. You said good. one answer. Right? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was close. It was close. <laughs> um, we are out of time, unfortunately. Um, like to thank First National for powering the podcast. Uh, thank you to Dow Vukovic, M. L. Emporio Properties Limited and Turner and Townsend for sponsoring the speaker video series here at the Toronto Real Estate Forum. And thank you again, Sherry, for coming on. Really Thanks appreciate it. Me. I appreciate being here. Thank you. We'll keep on having you back until we hit the 20-year mark. <laughs> and we'll find out. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, <exactly>. Sure. <laughs> of course. Look forward to that.